Association. Top alcohol dragster pilots, along with their counterparts in the fiberglass body top alcohol funny cars, will be striving to run the quarter mile in less than six seconds. Then, it's the exotic machines of Competition Eliminator in what should be some of the closest side-by-side -side racing of the day. Welcome, everyone, to the newly renovated and thoroughly modern Pomona Raceway for the Cheap Auto Parts Sports Nationals. One week ago, the NHRA's debut of this beautiful new tower complex was postponed by badly needed rain in Southern California. But before the weather set in, fans were treated to a new national record at top alcohol dragster set by the kid from Bass Lake, California, Brooks Brown, at a 5.69 second elapsed time in what is truly a unique machine. It's time to get with the action, sports fans. We begin with the second round of top alcohol dragster competition, and that is Bill Barner. He is a professional in a sportsman category. Don't ask. Somehow, he manages through sponsorship and race winnings to support a family. In the far lane is a local driver, Larry Sutton, and he has been a big story, Brockage. He defeated the world champ, Blaine Johnson, in round one with a big hole shot. Absolutely. Uh, Johnson uh, was really surprised because uh, Sutton ran a 6.04, and he was only the 15th qualifier, so he knocked off a major player when Johnson went down. Now, if anybody knows how the starting line works, though, it's Larry Sutton. He has been a professional starter at drag strips all over Southern California when they still existed since the middle 60s. So Larry has pushed that button and watched more wheels leave the beam than probably anybody on the planet other than Buster Couch, NHRA's official starter. And he uses that advantage. Sutton from Anaheim Hills, California, only qualified 15th, but uh, he's improved on that performance as he goes into the second round. Bill Barney used to be out of Sacramento, California, but uh, figured Knoxville, Tennessee was a better base to run all the divisional and national events. He has one of the few 300-inch chassis wheelbases in the entire uh, Eliminator category. Most guys don't feel you need it that long, but uh, Barney says he did it for stability. A lot of Barney's equipment floats around in uh, alcohol dragster ranks. He's uh, one of the best of the uh, fabricators and builders and keeps a lot of guys in business just through his expertise. The RPMs come up. Sutton is away first. Can Sutton do it again? Yes, he can. The green car owned by Jerry Darian wins at 6.01 to a losing 5.97. So now Blaine Johnson has good company in Bill Barney as they both fall to the hole shot. Watch the car in the far lane. Oh, boy, there it is. A 4.10 and uh, to Barney's 4.61, uh, and that did it because Barney uh, ran a good ET, but uh, actually a little quicker, a 5.97 against the 6.01 for Sutton but it was that reaction time that did it for Sutton. And Steve Evans, the man in the far lane, has had everybody talking so far this weekend. Oh uh, yeah, that is Brooks Brown, the guy I talked to earlier uh, in our show in the open uh, with the new national record at 569. But one thing his opponent, Jay Payne, knows is that those nitro cars have never achieved much consistency. Only two drivers since about 1975 have actually won an event title with an injected car. Brooks Brown being uh, one of them. He's only 20 years of age. You just saw his car owner back away. That is Tom Topic out of the beautiful Central California town of Bass Lake, California, is Brooks Brown. Jay Payne, oh, lives about 15 miles from Pomona Raceway here in Upland, California. He's been running all kinds of alcohol cars uh, as long as the category has been in existence. Darn good racer. And I tell you, Brooks Brown knows that. Even though Brown appears on paper to have a big advantage, he has got the match wheels off the starting line. He can't be another Bill Barney or Blaine Johnson. <laughs> no, Larry Sutton sure has proven the fact that upsets can happen here. And look at this. They leave very close together, but a full car link victory. And I'll tell you, this has got to be demoralizing for the alcohol guys. Brooks Brown runs a 586 and puts away Jay Payne's 593. A 593 should win just about any drag racer in, but not when you race that nitro car. Both ran almost exactly the same speed at 233 miles an hour and change. With the wheels in the air, you can see how much harder the Jay Payne car launched. Plus, he had about a hunter's advantage off the mark. But here is where they fear the nitro cars. Look at Brooks Brown assert himself in the far lane. Jay Payne is going, oh my gosh, he's done it to another one. Okay, here we go. 
third race in this round, second round actually, of Top Alcohol Gregster. Kind of uh, a misnomer with that nitro car in here, but he certainly belongs in the category. All right, and next stop is Russ Conroy in the near lane, being backed up in his burnout tracks, which is so very important. Now, his car sports the fairly conventional uh, Keith Black engine around 460 cubic inches. He qualified 13 at a 6.02, beat Steve Perry in round number one, and comes from San Dimas, California, which is about a block away from Pomona Raceway. The other car, Rick Santos, that's a whole other animal, though, Brock, from Northern California. It sure is, Steve. That is a small block Chevy. Most of these, as you know, are big blocks and a very rare machine. And take a good look, because it's the last time you're going to see him today. Santos red lights against Conroy, who moves on. Conroy actually only runs a 629 at 160. Santos would have had him beat at a 605 221, but the red light put him away, Steve. Wasn't even a close red light, a .36, a .40 being perfect. All right, up next, this will be the final race in this round of top alcohol drags. Over in the far lane, in fact, there you see her during her burnout. That is Tiffany Highland, and she will be up against Frank Pedragon of the drag racing Pedragons. He has two brothers in the nitro classes, a world champion Cruz Pedragon and his brother Tony in top fuel. So uh, this family knows a lot about the quarter mile. All right, Tiffany Highland, she is really a comer in this sport. She qualified number six in a 597. So uh, if anybody can run with these nitro cars, uh, Tiffany might be the one to do it. In fact, she beat a nitro car in round number one, Mark Niver out of Phoenix, Arizona. Tiffany Hills from Springfield, Oregon. It has some good corporate sponsorship. Frank Pedragon out of Phillips Ranch, California, which is about three-tenths of a mile from Pomona Raceway. The locals are doing very, very well here today in alcohol drinks to competition. I suppose the Pedragon family can sit on their front porch and listen to how Frank does today. Oh, I guarantee you they can. All right, Tiffany Highland, she qualified sixth. Pedragon qualified third, but yet only a few hundredths of a second separate them. That's how tightly uh, compacted this field was from qualifying. Very competitive. It's a good race. It's a real good race. Tiffany has to come from behind, and she does it cleanly. Her mom likes that a lot. A 591. She improves tremendously in her qualifying effort at 232 miles an hour. Pedagon slows down from his qualifying try at a 604, 229 miles an hour. But Pedagon was off the mark first by 200. And that's something Tiffany will have to be very careful of. You just can't be 200 late and continue in elimination with this kind of a field. She had good power on the top end, though, and uh, that will put her into the next round, the final four. So Tiffany Highland moves on. And in the semifinal round, Tiffany Highland will take on Larry the Snake Sutton. Two hole shots uh, to his credit so far on eliminations. And in the second pair, it'll be Brooks Brown, the killer nitro car, against uh, Brock's friend, Russ Conroy. Right now, we've got the national champion, Bob Newberry, going against Brett Williamson in more round two action in the funny car. Steve Evans and uh, Newberry, well, he's off to a good start so far this season. Absolutely. This is the initial event. He qualified number one. He uh, was triumphant in round number one, held one week ago before the weather moved in. And Brett Williamson has to be very concerned racing Newberry. He is, after all, the Winston champion, as we said. And he has lane choice, Newberry does, compared their elapsed times from first round a week ago, a 6.01 to a 6.15. Uh, but Williamson has proved that he can run as quick as a 6.02 because he did that in qualifying. And in round number one last week, beat Gary Selzy. Well, Newberry is going at this uh, whole campaign, Steve, as he said, really uh, on a very conservative basis. He's, uh, he's not going out to set any big ETs. He's not uh, doing anything other than to run as consistently as he possibly can and to just, uh, as he said, take one round at a time. And I think that's really the only way he can be successful. Remember, this man has been a player in top alcohol funny cars for a long time, whereas Brett Williamson out of Campbell, California, not quite as well known, but a good, solid competitor. Well, Bob Newberry is uh, connected to New York. He feels that a conservative approach is necessary because the nemesis of the class, obviously, is Pat Austin, who's the second winningest driver in NHRA history. But with Austin trying to campaign an alcohol car and a top fuel car, I think Newberry feels uh, that's uh, too big a fight to try to take and that that will be his Achilles heel. So Bob's just going to go out and win as many races and rounds of races as he can 
to stack up the points. Parker Avenue, they call this in honor of the late police chief of Pomona, California, that was so instrumental in getting this racetrack going back in the early to mid-50s, Ralph Parker. All right, it's a great start. Boy, they leave right together. Williamson is in it, but not quite enough. Newberry out powers him, a 597 at 232 to a 604 at 219 miles per hour. Newberry was off the line, oh, just a wink ahead. That could have been the difference in staging even. Uh, for all intents and purposes, it was if one throttle foot went down on both cars. And you can see Williamson, he was looking pretty good. Right now, the fans from the San Jose area where he's from were thinking, oh boy, this could be our guy. But then, the Eastern Invader, Bob Newberry, asserted himself and uh, it really wasn't very close. So Newberry moves into the semifinals. Right, here's a guy who's gonna get a great big break right now. It is local favorite Lou Gasparelli. He qualified 16th, which means he barely, barely made the show. He was on the bubble and had to sweat that out. Only ran a 621, but he's got a buy because his competition, Jackie Stedham, apparently could not make the call. Gasparelli from West Covina, California, Half the people in the grandstands probably have a vested interest in this car. They have the largest crew and the biggest bunch of friends and fans around their pit area of maybe any car. Gasparilli, a former Winter Nationals champion, it's been a few years ago. He'd like to do it one more time. And I have a feeling Gasparilli will run it all the way through. He doesn't have to, he can just idle down the racetrack. Not his style, not on your own track. Lou Gasparilli bounces his way to, oh baby! A 596, he runs even better than Newberry at 235 miles an hour, he runs faster as well. So Gasparelli is gonna be a huge threat. Of course, this car will be too. That's the nitro machine of Brooks Brown getting some new bearings and uh, a clutch adjustment. We'll see him a little later on. Continues and Steve, the car that we see completing its burnout has probably dominated this sport, this particular component of the sport, really more than any other, other than Bob Glidden and Pro Stock. Oh, absolutely, and he's the first car that's had lane choice that has taken the far lane. We're talking about Pat Austin, the Castrol GTX Oldsmobile body machine. And is that a beautiful car in the near lane? Oh, man, I mean, that is Mike Andriotti. That is, geez, one of the prettiest paint jobs I've seen in a long, long time. Going back to what I said earlier, in my opinion, these are the hardest cars to drive in all of drag racing. And I'm talking pro stock, top fuel, funny car, the whole deal. It's because they have the same drivetrain as the dragsters we saw earlier. Bigger engines at about 550 cubic inches, uh, three-speed transmission, but the engine is out in front of the driver. It doesn't have the amount of weight over the rear wheels. And Pat Austin well knows these cars move all over the racetrack. It takes a real journeyman driver to get one to go straight. Mike Andriotti out of Calusa, California, which is up on the Central Coast, is one of the better known California drivers. He doesn't venture out of the state much. He can run uh, three national events within the state, the two here at Pomona, the one up at uh, Sears Point in August. Now, Austin, as I said, had lane choice. He qualified number three, beat Tom Bristow in round number one. Andriotti qualified number six. He put away Craig Peterson in round one, which was, of course, a week ago. A big crowd has returned here to Pomona. It certainly hasn't dampened their enthusiasm all of the rain. We've got a beautiful day and a beautiful race. Almost identical reaction times. Pat Austin, a lot of smoke out of the car, but still he runs low elapsed time of the entire event for Alcohol Funny Car at 590, 235. Andriotti, I told you he was pretty good. A 598. He didn't surrender easily at 231 miles an hour. Now look again. I think we'll see some smoke out of the Austin car as it gets further down the racetrack. Actually, Andrew Audi had him off the line by just a few thousand, so it was almost a perfect start by both cars. But uh, as you say, it's a 590 for Pat Austin, but it may be that he hurt something. You can see some smoke out of the car right there as they cross the line. So uh, we'll find out. Maybe some troubles for Pat Austin. Long, smoky burnout from Mert Littlefield in the near lane, a supercharger manufactured by trade. He'll be up against another member of the Austin clan. This is Pat Austin's Uncle Buck. Bucky Austin from uh, Tacoma, Washington, and he is one tough competitor uh, uh, on and off the racetrack. <laughs> Bucky's not a guy you want to have an argument with, I guarantee you. Bucky Austin from Fife, Washington, lives right out on the sound. As Bucky says, when the tide's out, the table is set. Beautiful place. Bert Littlefield from Garden Grove, California. Littlefield used to drive a nitro funny car and was, took a number of years off to uh, field a very successful business manufacturing superchargers. And now he's back 
having a good time and uh, doing R&D in his own product. You see poking out of the body there, the 1471 style GMC Supercharger. Well, as a matter of fact, he knocked off Randy Anderson in round number one, a good, strong runner. Look at this. Littlefield got out really well and then breaks as Bucky Austin moves on to the semifinals. Yeah, Bucky is 602, 231 miles an hour. It really wasn't in this one because uh, Littlefield had a much better reaction time. No, those aren't the Alps. Those, that's Mount Foley, just above Pomona Raceway. In the semis, it'll be Pat Austin up against his uncle Buck. That will have the lane choice. And it'll be Lou Gasparelli with lane choice over Winston champion Bob Newberry. The fans will like that one for sure. Back in the pits, there is Tiffany Hyland discussing her upcoming race with Larry Sutton with her mom and the rest of the crew. I'm sure they're telling her, just don't be late, kid. Sutton has been the master of the Christmas tree with two successive whole shot victories. And we go into competition eliminator featuring two of the best in the country. David Nickens, a former Winston champ two years ago, as a matter of fact, finished third in points last year as witnessed by his number three. Nickens out of Houston, Texas. He and his brother Robert had a, have a very successful engine building business. Nickens Brothers Racing Engines. Larry Kopp, you uh, heard Bob Fry talk to him earlier. Very competent guy out of Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, he gets the long distance award. And this is Handicap Staggered Start Racing. Kopp, he has a 906 national index. Nickens an 810. The difference is 96 hundredths of a second. And that is dialed into the Christmas tree. These are both 1982 Oldsmobile Cutlass automobiles. The big difference is under the hood. A V8, the car on the right-hand side of your screen, Nickens. A V6 for cops. So there's the huge difference in performance. And this handicap racing makes it possible to group a whole lot of different hot rods together using the national indexes as the equalizer. It's a lot of fun, but it takes a lot of patience on the part of the guy who leaves second, which in this case will be David Nixon by almost a full second. Can he wait it out? Yes! Yes, he did. In fact, Nickens cuts a fairly good light. And he gets around Cop at 754, 174 miles an hour. That is a half a second under the national index. But there's no breakout in uh, this kind of racing. Now, even though it's a staggered start, reaction time is still absolutely critical because it affects uh, the difference down at the finish line. And in this case, it was Cop at a .63 reaction time. 5.0 is perfect in sportsman racing because it's a half a second tree, not a four tenths as we saw on the alcohol cars. Nickens had the big top in charge. Gosh, it's tough to be the guy that has to sit there for a whole second. But the payoff is if the other guy red lights, you win automatically. So that's kind of the equalizer. All right, so Nickens defeats Cop, and Brock Yates is down at the far end to talk to the man from Houston, Texas. Well, David, how's she running? Well, I'll tell you, Brock, the car's been, uh, we struggled a little bit the first weekend. We're kind of getting a handle of it this weekend, and uh, proves with persistence that things will come around. And I tell you, if I can do my job driving, we're going to have a good shot at winning this race. Yeah, the day I got seemed to be building a little bit of a headwind. Will that bother you at all? Well, I don't think it'll affect my car as much as will some of these altereds and roadsters. But I tell you what, if we can uh, do our job up on the start line, we're going to be in good shape. We ran a tough guy there in Larry Cop, and uh, I tell you what, he's going to be a contender all year, and we were fortunate to get by him. Well, we, we know you're going to do your job. I hope the car works and everything runs well for you. Well, we thank you very much, and we're just proud to be here. Good, David. Well, David, uh, paying tribute to the aerodynamics of that Oldsmobile Cutlass as opposed to one of these pretty hot rods like this gorgeous Roadster here that is being driven by Jeff Krug. And Brock, it's the, the variety that makes Competition Eliminator so appealing. Yeah, just terrific visual impact. I mean, we had uh, Cop and Nickens, and uh, they were running in altered cars, but they were modern uh, uh, contemporary sedans. Jeff Krug and that beautiful uh, kind of street rod uh, roadster style automobile and Ed Shuck Jr. out of Hayward, California in a classic uh, rear engine rail dragster. And I'll tell you, Shuck, that is the car to beat. He was a number one qualifier, runs on an index of 810. The C Street Roadster index of 890, as we explained before, just subtract the two. And there's the head start, 8.0 seconds, eight tenths of a second, and it will go to the roadster. In round number one, it was Shuck, as we said, he qualified number one, beating former top fuel world champion Rob Bruins, who's back in the sport in competition eliminator. Craig, he qualified 13th, beat uh, Jerry Gravo in round number two. So watch the lights. Good green light racing. Whoa, and there's the disadvantage to a short wheelbase car. All over the racetrack was the Roadster, and the winner is Shock from South El Monte, California at 778, 144 miles an hour. Krug, 
kind of hobbles it through at 929, 142. Now watch, you can see where he got into trouble. A lot of weight transfer, very light on the front end. Maybe got a little bit out of the groove. And the last thing he wants to do is put a blue stripe on the concrete wall here at Pomona. But he got it out of the racing line, and that was all it took to open the door for Mr. Schott, who uh, will go on to the semifinals. All right, a couple of more interesting automobiles come to the line. That is Rick Hort in that uh, double B altered blown Corvette running on gasoline. Mark Chaperone in the other lane in a, a pretty contemporary Oldsmobile altered automobile. Uh, more like a pro stock car, Steve Evans, uh, body style wise. Speaking of body styles, Mark Chaperone and his family from San Diego are big time in the body and fender business all over that part of Southern California. Rick Hart from Kissimmee, Florida, another guy that made a long, long trip. Uh, but with his little double B altered, he's on an 821 index Chaperone with the G altered at nine flat. So uh, as you might imagine, it's a supercharged car who has to wait 79 hundredths of a second. It takes guts to run a blown car on gas and competition eliminator because you give up a tremendous amount of consistency. But the true hot rodders that love those blown cars cannot be dissuaded. And here he goes. He's got a shot at getting into the semifinal round. Well, it's going to take some discipline because Hort is going to leave on him by almost a full second. Ah, oh, but it's Chaperone with the better reaction time. Here comes the blown power. Oh, short by a few inches. Mark Chaperone goes to the semis at 8.51, 158 miles an hour. We got to give you the time to speak, though, on that great bet. A 7.69 at 167 miles an hour. Now, that is a ride. Chaperone had the better reaction time by three hundredths of a second. But here came Horde. Great looking Corvette. The fans have a soft spot for any of the blown cars. I think the competition eliminator. And I'll tell you, if he could, uh, with a better reaction time, might have won this race. That 300 Chaperone putting the bank off the mark might well have made the difference. Look how close it really was. Oh, yeah, 100 might have made the difference. Brock? 851, Mark. That'll fly. That's right there. Going to buy that? I'm going to buy that. That's 49 under. We're not CIC'd. And uh, I think everybody else going in the finals is CIC'd except for David Nickens. And he's on the other side. So you're feeling good about today, huh? Well, you know, I sat down with Tony before the race and he said, brother, you got to go up there with ice in your veins and just do your thing. It's you in that lane. You just do your thing, baby, and you're going to be there at the end. Good pep talk. Work. It worked real well. I'm proud of him and I'm proud of the crew. Good job, Mark. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye okay. now. CIC means if you run more than a half a second under the index, the very next round they're going to attack an additional five hundredths of a second penalty on top of it. That's why they're trying to win with like an 849 instead of an 851. Keeps the competition really even and rather than adding weight or uh, uh, reducing the displacement or doing all sorts of mechanical stuff to the cars to slow them down, they just dial in a little extra time into the that really magic electronic timing system the NHRA uses. That's right. Bob Haas, he understands uh, being CIC. It's happened to him many times on a Sea Valley, California. He runs hard. Tom Hayner from Scottsdale, Arizona, will be his competitor. Now, it's a C Economy Dragster. That's a carburetor with an automatic transmission. Uh, because Hayner's A Dragster, which is the fastest class in all of competition eliminator. They are capable, I believe this year, of hitting 200 miles an hour with A Dragsters. Well, Tom Hayner in the near lane is going to sit for a while, and that is going to take some discipline. And I'll tell you what, Steve, it's been amazing. We have not had any red lights in this round with these cars. No, we have not, uh, and that's amazing considering some of the long handicaps. Hayner's car in the near lane uses basically a pro-stock style motor. Oz is away. He could not wait. Hayner by less than three thousandths of a second. Red lights. I think he could have won it with a clean green. 698, 172, loses it. Paz a 783 at 169 miles an hour. So that will set up our pairings for the competition eliminator final four. It's going to be the San Diego driver, Mark Chaperone, up against Bob Haas, and Chaperone will have the lane choice. Good job, Mark. And the other half of the comp final four, it is David Nickens up against Ed Schuck, Jr. Nickens will have the lane choice over the dragster. Did you see the red light in the other lane? Yeah, I did. I, I, um, I'm a little uh, slow today, so I'm trying to get lane choice over these guys. They're a little bit faster than me. So I'm uh, pushing it out the back door, trying to get it, whatever I can out of it, this little small motor that Maropolis built for me. 
Bill goes, Bill uh, builds a good motor, and I just uh, want to make him look good, so I'm trying as hard as I can. <laughs> so you were squeezing the light too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I, I got on it. So good job. Well, uh, onward and upward. And I, uh, are you are you concerned about lack of horsepower in this thing? No, it's not the horsepower. It's just uh, this is new to me, this class, and I'm just yeah. trying to take every advantage I can. Uh, Bill's helped me a lot, and I just want to make sure I look good for him. Good deal. Thank you. It ain't easy, especially if you're up new to the competition. And here's a young woman who is very quickly earning a lot of respect in the alcohol dragster ranks. Tiffany Hyden will meet Larry Sutton when we come back to Pomona, California. Stay with us. But first, let's go down to Steve Evans with a report on what's happening to Pat Austin and that possible engine problem. After all the smoke we saw to Pat Austin's car the previous round, we came to their pits expecting to see an engine change. They arrived here expecting to do one. Good news. All it did was blow a head gasket and didn't hurt the block or the cylinder head. And uh, Walt Austin thinks that might have happened this morning warming the car up, and it got progressively worse with the tremendous boost they get out of that Whipple supercharger. But all's well in the Austin camp. About four bucks picks this one. Boy, a lucky break for Pat Austin and his crew, which keeps them in the favorite position in uh, alcohol funny cars, which is exactly the role this young man enjoys in top alcohol dragster, Brooks Brown. Coming to the line against Russ Conroy, who says he's going to need a monster break to beat Brooks Brown. And when you're racing an injected fuel dragster, sometimes you get the monster break because they break. They are so hard on parts, they tend to shock the tires loose. A lot can go wrong with one of those cars. Tom Topping has probably detuned this car a little bit to race Russ Conroy. Conroy whips Brown on the lights. But then the blower belt comes off his car, and Brooks Brown wins it at 584, only 218 miles an hour. Here you can see Conroy, he had a nice advantage over Brooks Brown. Until, now watch this snake looking thing fly off the motor. Right, right, right there. That's the blower belt coming off. Well, there is Tiffany Highland, the fire roll car out of the state of Oregon, up against local favorite Larry Sutton, his car owner, Jerry Darian. Uh, a couple of guys that have lived by the sword, Brock. By that I mean hole shots. Can he get one more? Well, he's already got Blaine Johnson and Bill Barney uh, notched on his uh, gun handle, so uh, Tiffany Highland could be the next one. Can he do it three times in a row? Well, let's see. All right, there is Sutton. He's in the near lane. He did not have lane choice. That went to Tiffany Highland, and she selected the far side. They're starting to lean in that direction. Being carefully moved into the beams. You don't want to stage too deep. It cuts down the rollout and the amount of time that you can try to anticipate the light just a little bit. All right, so set in their lane. Tiffany Hot on the far lane. One will go to the final round to race Brooks Brown. Whoa, it's a great start by Tiffany Highland and all out of shape and almost into the wall is Larry Sutton. Tiffany Highland wins it at 594, 230 miles an hour and by three thousandths of a second, not much, she had the better light. All right, let's go down to the starting line again with Bob Fry. Let's meet Sam Shockley, Tiffany's crew chief. Robert? Sam, the car's making a lot of power, but the kid's doing her job too, isn't she? Yeah, she's driving really well, and I'm pretty happy. I'm really surprised the car's made those three good 590 runs in a row? No, not really. I did a lot of uh, work over the winter, and uh, it's paying off, and she's driving well. Going to be able to stop that injected car? I don't know. We're going to have to step it up a little, aren't we? Great job for Sam Shockley and Tiffany Highland. Okay, let's have another look at it. Watch Tiffany over in the far lane, and you'll see she leaves right with or a little bit ahead of Larry Sutton. But now let's watch the green car. He's got the wheels in the air. Right now, it goes into a horrible shake. You can see the body panels all vibrating. That shakes the tires loose, causes him to lose control. He gets pointed at the concrete and says, no, 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 no. So Larry Sutton wisely throws in the towel on this one. Tiffany Highland goes to the final round where she will race Brooks Brown in that tough injected fuel car. Now, who will have the lane choice? Well, if you've been paying attention, you know that it's Brooks Brown because he's in the 580s and Tiffany's in the 590s. We'll be seeing that a bit later on. And here we go into the semis of the blown alcohol cars, and there is the crowd favorite, I guarantee you, Lou Gasparelli. And here burning out is the invader from the East, the Winston champion, Bob Newberry. This is truly East meets West, bro. No question about it. And I'll tell you what, Newberry's going to have his hands full with Lou Gasparelli. He's run really well uh, at Pomona. He knows this racetrack very well. And as you say, if there's any reason to hope for some kind of 
psychic support from the fans. He sure has got it here because, uh, as you said, Bob Newberry all the way from back east uh, runs the entire Winston Championship Tour, though, and he's been here a bunch of times, so it isn't like he's a stranger to Pomona. And one other ace that Gasparelli is holding is Lane Choice, and he's selected the far side. I personally don't think there's any advantage in lane choice right now other than maybe a psychological one. I mean, every uh, advantage you could possibly have makes you feel a little bit better about the race. Well, there is a man right there that uh, is about as cool a head as there is in this business. He doesn't ever seem to get rattled. He never seems to show a lot of emotion, but you can be sure in the seat that he's in right now, it takes a ton of emotion to run one of these things properly. Well, Lou Gasparelli has never been accused of being without emotion, as we'll see if Gasparelli uh, proceeds through this competition. All right, Gasparelli over on the far or right-hand side of your screen as we look head on. Bob Newberry's connected in the yard. You see the body start to rattle from the torque of the engine. They're pre-staged. Newberry's in. Gasparelli's in. Newberry sound asleep. Gasparelli, huge hole shot. Newberry charges. It is not enough. The Southern California product, Lou Gasparelli, goes into the finals at 599-234 to Newberry's 599-231. The difference was off the mark. Look at Gasparelli. He not only cut a tremendous light of 4-2, Newberry was way off his game with a 5-1 light. So Gasparelli theoretically could have run about a 6-10 and still have beaten Newberry. Gasparelli had a bigger speed, even though here it appears, I guess just the camera angle, that Newberry is charging. All right, terrific race, Gasparelli to the final. All right, Pat Austin and Bucky Austin. Interesting, both families involved in the same industry in the Northwest, uh, and that is uh, the exhaust business and radiator business. Uh, they're not a real close family. In fact, there have been uh, some pretty good feuds over the years between the two of them, but uh, they all seem to be smiling and uh, not exchanging speed secrets, certainly, but at least uh, cordial to each other, Buck. That's right, and uh, Bucky definitely the underdog, but he is always capable of an upset. He doesn't run the full circuit, but when he shows up, he usually comes to play. Bucky away first. He's got a shot. Ah, oh, but Austin with his new head gasket pounds out a 593 at 237 miles an hour. That's going to give him lane choice over Gasparelli in the final round. All right, so the finals are set. It is Pat Austin against Lou Gasparelli. Austin has the lane choice by seven hundredths of a second. That's a pretty big margin. Let's go down to Brock with the winning driver. Well, Pat, it's always great to see the Austins go at each other. That was a good race. Uh, but uh, most important, you're going up against Gasparelli, and uh, he's running real strong as well. Yeah, you know, all these guys out here are running real good. The pace has stepped up this year, definitely. I mean, in all classes that I've seen this weekend, I'm just glad that we're going into the final round. You know, that's your objective is to take a round at a time, and, and that's what we're doing. And unfortunate to, to race my uncle, you know, in the semis. I'd like to race him in the final, but, you know, somebody's got to lose, and Bucky's a tough racer, and I like racing him because it's a lot of fun for us, but uh, we're going in the final round. Pat, uh, wind's kicking up a little bit. It's almost a headwind. Did it bother the car at all? Not really. The sleek Castrol Oldsmobile, you know, it, it just shoots right down through there through the wind, and, and the, the way the track conditions are today, I don't think a wind is too much of a problem right now. Okay, so good luck in the final. Thank you. An incredible drag racer, Pat Austin. Stay with us, everyone. When we come back, we'll have the semifinals of Competition Eliminator. Ought to be real close action. Steve Evans, guaranteed. David Nickens, one of the best runners in this class. But he is up against a very consistent dragster here, Ed Shook Jr. His reaction times have been good. He's been running right at about a half a second under the index. Here you can see only 14 hundredths of a second will be the starting line advantage for Shook. Believe it or not, the dragster leaves first. The uh, bodied car, the old Cutlass, is actually much quicker. It's got a lot more horsepower. David Neckins, Winston champ just a couple of years ago. He's only won it one time. He's come close any number of times. The racing businessman out of Houston up against Shook, who's a local product. Reaction time could be everything here. And it goes to Shook. Nickens did not cut a very good light. And it hurts him. The former champ gets drilled by the little dragster. A 768, 172 the winning time. 755, 174 miles an hour the losing time. Let's look at it one more time. It was the whole shot that proved the difference. You just can't give away seven hundredths of a second off the starting line. 
Now, sometimes it's not fair to blame the driver. It may be the car's actual reaction time. The little dragster may move quicker than the heavier Olds Cutlass, but whatever. It hurt Mr. Nickens a full car length. Okay, now one of these next two drivers will be racing young Mr. Shook in the final round to come later on this afternoon. And again, it's a bodied car versus a dragster. The bodied car is Mark Chaperoni, the G Aldered, running on a nine flat index. His opponent, Bob Haas, in the C Economy Dragster, small block Chevy, 8.25 the index. 75 hundredths of a second is the difference, Brock, and that is a light and a half on the Christmas tree, essentially. It's a long time for Bob Haas to have to wait, an eternity, really, and it takes enormous mental discipline to wait. And he does it okay. No red lights here. Good, clean start. Oh, absolutely. In fact, Haas had a little better reaction time than Chaperoni. What a drag race. Chaperoni at 8.51. He outmuscled him. 159 miles an hour. Haas is 45 hundredths of a second under the index. Chaperoni 48 hundredths under, and that's the difference. A little over three hundredths of a second. Boy, that was one great drag race. I'll tell you today, Competition Eliminator has not let us down in terms of variety and excitement. In this final angle, you know that Mark Chaperoni in the near lane is hoping that his peripheral vision does not pick up the spindly little front wheels on that dragster. And I don't think they did. All right, pairings for the comp final. We'll be seeing Mark Chaperoni. And will he have lane choice? No, he will not. Ed Chuck Jr. will get that honor, but uh, I don't think that's a big factor unless uh, there's some kind of a major oil down or whatever. And NHRA is so good at cleaning that stuff up, it's hardly a factor anymore. Super stock Rick Hauser went away with the victory. In the stock class, Kenny Moore was the winner. Super Cop went to Rod Hartzell. Super Gas winner was Paul Elabob. And the junior dragster winner was Brad Fink. Our congratulations to all those guys. Great job. Now it's time for Competition Eliminator. One of the most competitive categories in all of an entry championship drag racing, as you have seen today. Mark Chaperone, San Diego, the G altered over on the far side. The C Economy Dragster of Ed Shook Jr. here in the near lane. And I think this is a pick of final. I'm Brock. Going to be really interesting. And uh, again, it uh, highlights the wonderful mechanical contrast of this particular class. Mark Chaperoni in a car that looks like a state-of-the-art pro-stock car from a distance. And, of course, uh, in a Shook in a car that uh, dates back all but 10, 15 years as far as uh, dragster technology is concerned, at least externally. That's right. Chaperoni will have the advantage, 81 hundredths of a second, and every hundredth is precious, especially off that starting line. And I'll tell you, uh, when it gets this dark, you can really see that yellow light. Your reaction time might even improve. Chuck has almost a perfect light. Chaperoni was a little bit late. Chaperoni's got big problems sideways in the middle of the racetrack, and he tags the wall with the left rear quarter panel. It is all Ed Shook. At 8.48, 110 miles an hour, he shut it off almost completely. I'm sure he saw Chaperoni dead sideways in the middle of the racetrack when he drove by and thought, this guy is no longer a threat. Let's see if we can see what happened to Mark over on the far side. As always, the wheels are up in the air. Maybe it lands with the wheels just a little bit cockeyed. Whatever, there you see it getting out of the groove. He heads for the wall. Does a nice job of correcting it right there. Looks a little bit like a Winston Cup driver trying to save the machine, and he darn near does it. The most important thing is he kept it out of Shook's lane. Here we thought, you know, he may not even scratch this car. But we were wrong. Doink. All right, let's go to Brock down at the far end with the winner. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm sorry about the way I had to win it there. Uh, it looked like Mark spun out. He almost got in my lane. Uh, I backed out of it and uh, just wanted to stay out in front of him. Yeah, I think uh, we're going to get a chance to talk to him, find out what happened. But uh, I think everything's all right. You, uh, you had a good clean pass, though, other than that. Yeah, I backed out of it. Uh, it felt good. The light was green when I left, which I was real happy about. Uh, I don't know what the reaction time was, but uh, it felt pretty good. Well, I'll tell you what. 504, how's that for reaction time? Not too shabby. No, is that what it is? Yeah, it is. Wow, it was close. I knew it when it came up green. Uh, I want to thank uh, Flowtech Racing Heads and uh, ERC Gasoline and uh, uh, the Hogan's Intake Manifolds and my dad for putting this thing together. Congratulations. Eddie. Thanks again. Okay. Well, I tell you, your ego just loves hearing you cut almost a perfect light. That's a huge reward for these guys. Well, speaking of guys, here's a girl. Tiffany Highland over in the far lane. Her blown alcohol dragster will be up against Brooks Brown. 
you not only have a guy racing a girl, you've got an ejected nitro car against a supercharged alcohol car. But first, uh, indeed, Brock Yates has caught up with Mark Chaperoni. Let's see exactly what happened. Brock? Well, Mark, uh, disappointing way to end a really nice day. I mean, you were really rolling well, and uh, what happened? Well, uh, had a great leave, felt like a real strong leave, hit second gear, was still straight, went into third gear, and I felt the rear end starting to come around on me. And uh, rather than hit the brakes, uh, when I was up at Bondurant Driving School a couple years, they said, just go with it. So I just steered into the darn thing, felt the rear end coming around, just tried to keep the wheel straight and off the brakes, and we drove out of it, thank God. A little road racing practice out. A little Bob Bondurant road racing practice okay. there, you bet. All right, well, sorry it ended like this. Oh, uh, me too. It was a rough night. Okay, thankfully he's all right, and the car will be easily repaired. As soon as that sun dropped out of sight, boy, what a drastic change in the weather. It's cooled off tremendously. The uh, moisture in the air is up, and I'm sure that's got to concern Tom Topic, uh, considering the violence of this two-speed automobile. He shakes hands with uh, his young comrade. And Tiffany Highland over in the other lane, she's ready to race. Uh, we saw her not only match wheels with Larry Sutton around before, but she actually left a little bit ahead of it. Oh, yeah. Tiffany's getting to be, uh, as you say, one of the best in this uh, particular class. And as you observed very accurately earlier, in a very challenging class of race cars. These are not easy to drive. And uh, Tiffany Highland is deporting herself well. Look at this. An almost perfect lead by her. A great drag race. Ah, uh, but it's the power of the Nitro car that pays off. Brooks Brown at a 593 to Tiffany's 597. And there was a moment there that I thought maybe Brooks Brown was in real trouble. Let's go down to Tom Topping and Bob Fry. Congratulations, boy. I guess those A fuel cars really run. Well, we can keep them consistent. We proved that, and we're just going to keep trying to get race after race. You'd like to share some of those secrets with us? Nobody else can make them run four runs. Uh, we're not exactly sure how we do it either. We just keep plugging away, try to be conservative, and, and you know, keep the thing consistent. Well, this car was awesome and consistent here this weekend. Congratulations. Brooks Brown was right now in replay it won't look like Brooks Brown was off the mark first because the car is so lazy but he was the reaction time doesn't lie I watch the car in the near lane it'll come out here and it'll spin the tires just enough right about there to let Tiffany get a full car length advantage but Brooks big top end charge 233 miles an hour was enough to more than make up that difference well, I'll tell you what, you rolled out with a national record last week and uh, capped it with a championship this week. Not a bad way to end a whole deal. Not a bad way at all. This is great. Gerald in Florida, yeah! 93. Did you think you could run it like that in the dark? Uh, it got all out of shape on me. I was steering like mad. I was all over the place. It slowed down. It spun the tires bad out there. Great pass. Good job. Thanks Congratulations, Brett. Thanks a lot. Pat Austin going against decidedly upset-minded Lou Gasparelli. And I'll tell you what, Steve Evans, uh, Gasparelli has run so well and so consistently today, he may be able to overcome that 593 that Austin laid down earlier. That's right, and Gasparelli has been very calm. I've seen him uh, at other races where that wasn't the case. But he seems to have complete trust in Bob DeVore and all of his crew. And as he told you earlier, I'm not even going to try to watch that car the other way. Just drive, lose, race. Do your own thing. And that's easy to say, but harder to do. So the Dodge body car here in the near lane will be up against the Oldsmobile body car over in the far lane. Pat Austin, that for a number of years has literally owned this class. He is second only to Bob Glidden, the total number of championships he has won. That's alcohol, dragster, and top fuel. And he's about 25 years younger than Glidden. So there's a good chance that he may ultimately take that away. But, uh, you know, Southern California drag racing fans love night drag racing. They grew up on it out here. And this wasn't intentionally supposed to finish at night, but uh, here we are with all of the weather delays and so forth that have gone along with this race. The Gasparelli will be very, very confident running in this light. And Pat Austin, for that matter, too. He's done a lot of night racing up at Seattle International Raceway near his hometown in Kent, Washington. Trying to get the burnout smoke out of the cockpits. Uh, Austin has a huge supercharger. That Whipple supercharger I talked about earlier, Fairly controversial piece. NHRA has regulated how hard you can overdrive it. That was Mike Austin saying, drill him, bro, drill him. <laughs> yeah, the Whipple is uh, really an effective piece, but uh, some of the people are complaining that it may be a little bit expensive, but uh, uh, technology is always expensive in any kind of motorsport. It may be expensive, but it's bulletproof. You can't even break the thing. Okay, they're off Gasparelli hanging in there. 
Austin a little out of shape. It is Lou Gasparelli, and this place will go nuts. And he went on a whole shot. 595 to a 593. Let's take another tribute to his driving this time. It was Gasparelli with a 460 light to Austin's .487. And not very many people could say they left on a final round against Pat Austin. The picture says it all. All right, Lou, congratulations. I know uh, last time I, we talked to you was in here at the Winter Nationals. A 93 to a 95, a whole shot wins it. Uh, he he, he low ET'd you, but uh, just fantastic. Yeah, he just drove right around him. And, uh, you just... Those guys, I mean, my crew, Bob DeVore, the, the whole crew, I mean, they just put the car together. I've got so much confidence in this car that, I mean, I just got to drive it. It's simple. Well, great job. Uh, great haul shot, great pass, and uh, great championship. Thank you very much. Pleasure. When you've conquered in your personal life what Lou Gasparelli has, he's right. They are simple. Our congratulations to all of our winners here at the Cheap Auto Parts Sports Nationals. For Brock Yates and Bob Fry, I'm Steve Evans. So long from Pomona, California. The executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is George E. Orgera. The supervising producer is Tom Gee. Produced and directed by Mark Kuchin. The American Sports Cavalcade is a presentation of Diamond P Sports. <laughs>